thank God for his protection. Please take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter number 5. And we've been on the subject of worship for quite a while, and I've enjoyed this study. Uh, tonight's uh, passage does not mention the word worship in Matthew chapter number 5. Uh, but certainly the idea and the truth of worship is here. The title of the message is Reconciliation Before Worship. Reconciliation Before Worship. So what should we do? I guess the question could have been asked before it was put up there on the screen, but that makes the answer pretty obvious. What should we do before we worship? And biblically, the answer is be reconciled. I'm going to read chapter number 5, verse 21 through 26 uh, of the Word of God. I, I would ask you to follow along with your eyes and certainly with your heart as we read tonight. Jesus said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the utmost farthing. Now, of course, in this passage, which we uh, affectionately call the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in chapter number five, beginning uh, toward the beginning of the chapter, there are actually five sections, and what we just read is one of those five sections. And these five sections are Jesus explaining to us how that our righteousness can exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And Jesus said, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And so we have five sections, the first of which is in verse number 20. Actually, let me read verse number 20 so you can see that this is the preface of these five sections. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So how does our righteousness exceed or, or surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees? Well, in the beginning of verse 21, here's what... The, the law says, thou shalt not kill. But Jesus says, I want to take it a step further. Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And then you see another section in verse number 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. And believe me, the people here heard the Pharisees and the scribes say it plenty of times. Don't commit adultery, don't commit adultery, don't commit adultery, don't commit adultery. Insomuch that they would bring a woman taken in the act of adultery in front of Jesus and say, what are you going to do about it? They had heard the Pharisees say it plenty. And now Jesus says to the uh, people gathered there as he is preaching on this particular mountain. He said, you've heard about the not committing adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his, what's the next word? Heart. 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 Then you drop down to verse number 33. Uh, again, another section. Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, nor for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. 
And then, of course, verse number 38 is a section. Verse number 43 is also a section. I, I won't read through all of that, but I will suffice. Uh, hopefully this will suffice to summarize. How can your righteousness or my righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees? And here's the simple answer. It's all about the heart. In fact, if you lived in the time when Jesus was preaching this particular sermon, you could not, you could not outdo the Pharisees as far as actions. This morning I touched a little bit on tithing, and Jesus said about the Pharisees, they tithe of mint, anise, and cumin. That was, they would take the tithe of little, little uh, grams of herbs, you know, we're talking about if you would give 10% of your corn crop, they would take these, this little bit of two grams of this herb that they had, and they would give a pinch of that as a tithe to the Lord. That's how particular they were. You could not outdo them by the letter. And a Pharisee would proudly say, a scribe would say, I don't commit adultery. And I have never killed anybody. But as Jesus said, outwardly, they're like whited sepulchers. And inside, full of dead men's bones. See, so how can my righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees? It's all about the heart. It's about our worship being more than just hands, eyes, mouth, tongue, vocal cords, uh, it's about being more than just the wallet. It's, being, it's more than just the car that makes it to the church house. It's about the heart. You know, I, I, I appreciate all of our bodies being here tonight. Uh, I guess everybody brought theirs, right? All of our bodies are here. But God doesn't count bodies as much as he counts hearts. Is your heart here. And in our pride, we may say, well, I have never committed adultery. Jesus said, well, how about your heart? See, these Pharisees, when they would boast about their perfect morality, their perfect morality record, and take a woman, quote-unquote, taken in the act of adultery, and that's still suspect as you sort of examine that passage, but throwing her in front of Jesus, while they're boasting of their perfect moral record, Jesus would say, I believe the Bible record carries this out, their heart was absolutely immoral and evil to the core. They lusted in the heart. They were immoral in their heart. They were, they, were, they were deviant in their heart. And Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, you shall in no way enter into the kingdom of heaven. This passage we have before us brings us to the subject of worship because the Bible says when you bring your gift to the altar, there's a particular thing that is important to know and understand when you bring your gift to the altar. If you can picture this in your mind, there worship in the in the word of god was much more complicated and difficult than ours i have sympathy for someone who drives 20 minutes to church because i walk 20 seconds but when they went to worship it was usually days of a journey days and in order for at least the man of the home and oftentimes the family would join to make that several day long journey, then spend several days there in worship and then to return several days on a return trip. And then you have to take care of all of your responsibilities at home and make sure all of that's covered and everything is taken care of while you're gone. And it was a very tiring journey and it was a wearisome journey and it was an expensive journey to get there to offer a gift. And, and then sometimes you needed lodging for a few days while you were there in Jerusalem and had to keep track of your family and your children that were there. You remember that uh, Jesus and his family went to worship and they left Jesus there. You remember the story. So the family would often travel to the place of worship and, and there was uh, a, a great deal of financial expense. And I know it wasn't completely proper at this time, uh, but it was sort of the way it was in the temple. You had to exchange your money for temple money. And we know that Jesus overturned those money changers tables because they were they were thieves themselves, saying, well, you can't use this Roman money. Here's some temple money that you must buy. And, of course, it was, it was extortion to buy that, that money to offer in the temple. But if you were living in this day, you had to do it. You had to do it. 
Sometimes you would even purchase your sacrifice. They would require you to purchase the animal for your sacrifice there at the temple. And you had no choice on these things. And, and it was very costly. It was very expensive. And it was very time consuming. You had to wait in line because there were just a few priests. And there were a lot of people to offer sacrifices and to do gifts and to participate in this worship. So you waited your turn. And you would wait and you would wait and you would wait. And finally you'd get up there to the front and the priest would call you up and it's your chance. It's your time to offer your gift. It's your time to have your worship. It's your time to sacrifice. It's your time to open your heart. It's your time to, to commune with God. It's your time for a worship. And here's what the Bible says. You're standing before this priest. He's dressed in white. He probably has some blood on him from the sacrifices that were done before. It's a very solemn time. You're there to ask for divine mercy and seek forgiveness and find the grace of God and commune and worship. And the Bible says this in verse 23. Now we're on the subject of worship. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way first. Be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Now when I read that in that context of trying to put myself there on how difficult it was to even get to the front of the line that it's my turn. And now Jesus says, when you're there uh, and offering this gift, if you remember something against a brother, drop everything. Go make it right and come back. That makes me take a deep breath because that's a little bit of extravagant obedience. It's hard. By the way, obedience to God isn't always easy. It's often hard. There are special requirements. This gift that was offered, it seems as though it wasn't just an ordinary gift. This was something special. And in the context, a person that would come to offer a gift would be maybe voluntary. It would be something special. It would be something extra. It would just be a, 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 a different kind of gift that was not particularly law required, but it was something that they wanted to do out of their heart. So likely this person who is being explained here is offering this gift with a right heart, but when he comes to offer the gift with a pure heart and a clear conscience, the Bible says he remembers members so let's take it this way he didn't go to this to the offering of a gift knowing he had ought against his brother he arrives at the offering of the gift and he remembers i got something against my brother something against my brother if he would have already had it in his mind before he should not have even approached the altar with the gift But he approached the altar with his gift, and the Bible says that he had a remembrance. Uh, Here's a little bit of application. I think times of worship are special times of realization. Have you experienced that? I mean, God will bring things to my mind when I'm worshiping, especially in the church house, that isn't in my mind other times. He'll bring sin to my mind that I don't think about out there. But when I'm in here, and the word of God's open, and two young people sing a song like Victory in Jesus, it seems like the Holy Ghost just brings things to my mind that aren't brought to my mind out there. And that realization is a good thing. Right, church family? It's a good thing. It's a good thing. This man at the altar had this realization and remembered that there was something not right between he and a brother. Uh, Just on a little maybe a more humorous note, as far as I can tell, this is the only time in the Bible when God says we can slip out of church early. (laughs) All other times, just stay to the end. Uh, But here was this particular one. The Bible says that uh, Jesus said, when you bring your gift, if you remember, obeying God is not always convenient. Sometimes it is terribly inconvenient, uh, but it certainly must always be done to obey the Lord. And if I were analyzing this in my own human reasoning, maybe you're with me on this. If I was just going to be human about this and say, you know, here's my opinion. I would say, offer the gift and then go get things right. Wouldn't that make sense? You traveled all this way. It was all this time, all this expense. You waited in line. Here you are. Just offer the gift. Have this time of worship. Glad God brought it to your memory. But when you're all done here, then go get things right with your brother. 
That is not what God said. God said, you leave the gift. Don't offer it. Leave the gift. Go get things right. And then come back and offer your gift. And that's pretty powerful to me. I went to the BMV this week. And I texted Sarah. I said, there are 37 people in front of me at the Medina BMV. The line was out the door. And so I waited. For about an hour and 15 minutes, I waited. Standing, no seats, standing. It was a Medina, standing. And making my way through this long line that sort of circled around. And, and uh, standing. Did I say I was standing? I was standing the whole time <laughs> in this line just waiting uh, to get to the front. And I was about um, five people from my turn. And it just seems like things stalled there. And there was a, a, a lady who had come in uh, just very recently. And she was at the back of the line. The line was just as long as when I started. She had over an hour wait. And she had a baby and a baby carrier. And she set the baby on the floor in the carrier. And the baby was real quiet. And then the baby woke up and got out of the carrier. And she was holding the baby. And then I, uh, now I know that the rev God's revelation is done, but the Holy Spirit still prompts your heart, right? I was five people from the front. And it as if, as if the Holy Spirit said to me, if that baby starts acting up, you give her your spot. And I said, what? <laughs> give her my spot. <laughs> I've been waiting an hour, Lord, an hour I've been waiting. I've been standing for an hour here waiting in this line and then all the excuses started coming up. Well, why would she bring a baby here in the first place? You know, who would do something like that? It just should not be. And leave the baby at home. Where's the father? And uh, all these excuses started coming. And, and I said, all right, Lord, if that baby starts acting up, I will switch places. And, uh, but secretly I prayed, oh, be a good baby. Be a good baby. <laughs> And that was a good baby. It never acted up at all. She, uh, uh, I mean, he wailed at the top of his lungs, but never acted up at all. No, uh, it was a good baby, and I didn't have to switch spots. But uh, I didn't want to switch spots after waiting an hour. I just wanted to get what I had to done to get out. And here God says, if you went through all of those days' journey, and you're about to offer a gift to me and worship me and ask for grace and seek mercy and commune with me, but something's not right here with somebody else, and particularly the name brother is there several times. If something's not right with a brother, you leave it, go get it right, and then come back and offer that gift. I don't know if we think about this enough, that the unity that we have one with another really has a big part in play in our worship to God. Yeah. Yeah. True. Big part and big play. It is very important. Uh, Jesus did not come to abolish the law. He came to uh, fulfill the law and to realign the law with the heart. The Pharisees had moved the circumstances of the law away from the heart. And Jesus wanted to place back on the heart. And so he says, make sure that your heart is right with your brother before you offer your gift. And I just really have two quick things to say. Uh, first is this. Uh, the pricking of the Holy Spirit on our conscience is a wonderful thing pricking of the Holy Spirit on our conscience is a wonderful thing. Never object to the Holy Spirit pricking your conscience. It's as if this man at the altar could have said, oh, great timing, Lord. Why wouldn't you bring this to my mind when I was just outside the city and just arrived in town? Why wouldn't you bring this to my mind before I left home? Maybe the person I have something against is at home. Why would you bring this to my mind at some other point? Why would you bring this to my mind now? And here's the answer. Because God wanted it in your mind right then. Amen. Wanted it there. The pricking of the Holy Spirit on our conscience is a wonderful thing. Have you ever had something that the Holy Spirit has placed in your mind and you can't get it out of your mind? Some will say this, preacher, I just got this thing bothering me. Look, I, I never, I'm not upset about that. It's a blessing when the Holy Spirit puts something in your mind bothering you. Amen. It's good. It's healthy. 
Say, well, I'm, I'm always thinking about this person. I'm always thinking about this thing. I'm always thinking about this circumstance. I can't seem to shake it. It's always upon me. Then consider, consider the pricking of the Holy Spirit on that conscience and do what God is telling you to do. You say, but it's so inconvenient. Here we are talking about how inconvenient it is. And really, if we have something odd against a brother, we can contact them within seconds. Am I right? Within seconds. We could contact them within seconds in our outside this door. Nobody texting in church now, but we can contact people within seconds as soon as we walk out that door. Boom, 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 boom. Contact them. You know, maybe we should talk. I, I know we left last time. We were just angry with one another. Let's get together and talk and make this right. You can do that. It's not inconvenient. I think the inconvenience is we certainly don't have the, sometimes don't have the courage to overcome ourselves. It's not about overcoming our brother that has ought against us. It's often overcoming ourselves. Consider the sudden restraint that the Holy Spirit can put on a person. I, I have felt this times, at times in my life when the Holy Spirit just puts the brakes on. But maybe I want to say something and it's like the Holy Ghost says, no, you don't. Or when I want to go somewhere and the Holy Spirit says, uh-uh. Or when I feel like I should instruct somebody in a certain way, God says, nope, not this time. The restraint of the Holy Ghost. Paul felt that restraint when he wanted to go to a certain city and minister, and, and Paul said that the Holy Spirit would not allow us. Close the door. Wouldn't let us go. Now, not everyone is always going to like you. Can somebody say amen? Not everyone's always going to like you. Because in this text, the Bible says, if your brother has ought against you, and it is impossible to have everybody like you. Believe me, I've tried. I'd love to have everybody like me. It's just my personality. And it's impossible. Uh, every president that our nation has ever had has had half the country against him, right? Half the country. And as soon as the person becomes the president of the United States, the first words he speaks out of his mouth, he has alienated half the country. Immediately. And by the way, Jesus had people that hated him. So this passage does not mean that there cannot be anybody in your influence that maybe even has a grudge against you or a, or a, or a, uh, uh, or a, uh, a disagreement with you because the Pharisees obviously had judge grudges against Jesus. They hated him. But I think we, we, we have enough sense tonight. We're all, uh, many of us have been in church for a long time. This, this idea of having something against your brother goes along the lines of what's written in the book of Romans where it says, as much as is possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And the Holy Spirit tells us very clearly when there's some, um, when there is some schism between us and another believer that will always hinder our worship. Can I give a little bit of illustration uh, tonight that I think we can identify with? How many times, uh, those of us who've been in church for a long time, how often have we, on our way out the door or on our way to the church house, there has been a family blow up? Oh, come on now. I, it's not only my family where we've had family blow ups, right? Something's happened. Somebody's angry. Somebody didn't get ready in time. Somebody used all the hairspray. Something happened in the house where something did not go right and everybody's angry. Now, I'm just asking you to think about those times. We all know that that affects worship when we get here. Am I right? It affects our worship when we get here. So take it a step further. How about if you were in a church, and I'm glad our church is a unified church. This is a, I love coming to church, and I feel like there's unity among our people. But I, and I've never been in this circumstance or situation, but I've just heard it from, from other brothers and sisters. Where they come into the church house, and you can feel Half the church don't like the other half. And I, I want to ask you this. How can you worship when that's the case? How can you? Uh, in our text, I, I won't unpack everything that's here because some of it, honestly, I don't understand everything that's written in this passage. I, I don't understand about Reka and I got some ideas and about thou fool and why one is counsel and why one is hellfire. But I'm just going to summarize it this way. Whatever is happening between these two brothers, uh, we know that there's anger in verse 22, right? They're angry. Mm -hmm. Anger will mess up worship all the time. 
they are angry with the brother. And the Bible says this anger is without a cause. Now, this is where it gets great because we say, well, well us, my anger has a cause. <laughs> Pastor, I, well, my anger always has a cause. It's never unjustified. It's always justified. I believe there's really only one cause for, for anger, one good cause, and that's holiness. That's right. Righteousness. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that God has righteous indignation, mm -hmm. but it's righteous. This anger doesn't have a just cause. It's an anger that does not have a cause. The cause could only be carnal, or the cause could be fleshly, or the, uh, or, or the cause certainly is not just. And we also know from verse 22 of chapter 5 that there's name calling. <laughs> Rekha and thou fool. The anger had escalated to those types of name calling, which may have been insults or some kind of harassment, but the anger had gone to name calling and to insult. And Jesus said, if you bring a gift to the altar, and that is the case between you and a brother, you had better leave it and make it right. So there is a wonder, uh, a great blessing of the pricking of the Holy Spirit and also the priority of unity among the family. I heard a quote not long ago, maybe you've heard it before. They said, anger is just one letter from danger. You ever hear that? Anger is one letter from danger. And if there's anger in your heart, you are one letter away from the danger of messing up your worship with God. One letter, one letter. Because anger and, and, and lack of unity and hardships between brothers and sisters and the family of God disrupts everything spiritually. I just went through some of the books that Paul wrote in the New Testament and I won't have you turn to all of these. I'll give some references. But through all those books of the New Testament that God used Paul to write, he was constantly warning and instructing those churches not to fight, but to be together. Now, if you've studied some of these epistles, you know. Let me re read to you 1 Corinthians 6, 5 through 8. I speak to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you. No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren, but brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? And I like that phrase. Why don't you just take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud. And here's the last phrase. And that your brethren... Here was the Corinthian church that had all sorts of division between brother and sister, family members. We're talking about church family, and it disrupted worship. Even the Ephesian church, he had to write to them and say, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And he probably wrote that because there were some who were being unkind. There were some who were being unforgiving. There were some who were not practicing the uh, example of Jesus Christ. How about Philippians? Right at the uh, uh, beginning of chapter number 4, uh, verse number 2, I beseech Euodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. <laughs> so that's a nice way of saying what? <laughs> Tell those two to stop arguing. <laughs> Tell them to be the same mind in the Lord. Chapter number two of that same book, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. You say, why would that be in the book of Philippians? Because I believe there were some of the church that were doing things through strife and vain glory. And Paul constantly had to warn them under the inspiration of God that's going to ruin the worship of that gathering of that people. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Uh, First Thessalonians, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warm them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Now listen to this. This is the Thessalonian church. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. So Paul understood the Danger And even these good churches like the Philippian church and the Thessalonican church and these other great churches. There was an attempt to disrupt worship by causing a brother to be angry and have a problem with another brother. 
I think the text goes on, and I'll, I'll close here very briefly as we just have a time of prayer. But in verse 29, the, the wording changes. It's not brother anymore. Here's verse 24. Leave there thy gift before the altar. Go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Now here's verse 25. Still, still in the same group of, of having the heart right with people before you worship. Verse 25, agree with thine adversary. Now, I won't spend a lot of time on this. You'll say, well, Pastor, I'm okay with all the church people, but I got some of those other adversaries that things aren't right with them either. I, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's um, just, according to this passage, to say that I just have to be right with my brother and I can be at odds with everybody else in the world and still worship God. Because here it says adversary. In fact, if you look at the end of verse number 26, there seems to be a debt that needs to be paid. Right? Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the utmost farthing. There, farthing. there must have been some kind of business debt, something that was owed, something that was unpaid, a, a, a payments that weren't made on time, something that was borrowed and never given back, whatever it was, but something was not right between uh, two people who would not be in the same assembly of believers, who would not be considered a brother. Maybe you would consider them an adversary. But Jesus said, before you offer any gift, you make sure that you've done all you can to make your heart and relationship right even with an enemy. We like to coddle ourselves and say, well, I'm allowed to be mean to an enemy. We know better. Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So I said all that just to say this. I love worshiping God. And I believe we have a worshiping church. But I've been there. Or something that I have wrong with someone else, maybe even not my fault, it just disrupts, it disrupts every attempt I have to commune and walk with God. It disrupts my prayers, disrupts my service, disrupts my giving, disrupts my joy, disrupts everything. So I believe it was of the Lord tonight for us to just take a fresh look at this and say, God, I, when I come to the, to the altar with my gift, when I come to the stanza to sing my verse, when I come to the church to give my offering, when I go in my class to teach my lesson, when I get up there in the choir to sing my heart, I, I want my heart to be free from any encumbrance of some kind of schism or division or anger, or malice, or bitterness, or resentment that I have towards someone else. You say, well, I, isn't God just glad that I'm here? Isn't God just glad that I brought the gift? Isn't God just glad that I'm at the altar? Not if the heart's not right. Not if the heart's not right. Leave the gift, go get the heart right, and come back and worship. Can we bow our heads for a moment tonight for prayer?